ಸಮುದ್ರವಸನೀ ದೇವಿ ಪರ್ವತಸ್ತನ ಮಂಡಲೆ ವಿಷ್ಣು ಪತ್ನೈ ನಮಸ್ತುಭ್ಯಂ ಪಾದಸ್ಪರ್ಶ ಕ್ಷಮಸ್ವೀ ದೋಸ್ ಹು ಡೇರ್ ಟು ಫ್ಲೈ ಡೋಂಟ್ ಕೇರ್ ಟು ಲೀವ್ ದೇರ್ ಫುಟ್ ಪ್ರಿಂಟ್ಸ್ ಬಿಹೈಂಡ್ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಟು ಎಫ್ ವಿ ಎಸ್ Okay, very good morning everybody. Are you able to hear me and see my slide? Sir, yes sir, good morning sir. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so, it's actually a great day to have a class because it's the 117th anniversary of uh, December 17th, 1903. The first flight by the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk, uh, the first uh, recorded historical uh, controlled flight as you know. uh so we will talk about a few things related to um aircraft flight uh, which are uh, associated with um, structures in terms of uh, how the flight of the uh, aircraft uh, helps us in understanding the um, loads that need to be determined and how those loads are eventually transferred within the aircraft so that would be the uh, content of today's class um but uh, prior to doing that we will um, uh move from the 1d kind of structures that we were dealing with namely the beams uh, columns uh, rods and uh, shafts or combined uh, version of them uh, as we saw in the 4x4 and 6x6 matrices uh, we look at um, the shell like or plate like structures as well because you know wing panels and fuselage panels are um, typically very thin uh, shell like structures and how uh, we typically deal with them is also of interest so that's the um, agenda for today uh, once we are done with that uh, 2d structure we will um, look at uh, predominantly for today's class uh, the idea of load a uh, load factor um, a vn diagram or what is known as the flight envelope and eventually uh, how that uh, load gets transferred because the vn diagram doesn't talk much about um, the actual structural components it talks about the aircraft as a whole uh, especially in the um, vertical direction so we will uh, explore uh, certain aspects of it without going into details because it is the realm of flight and space mechanics and or um, aerodynamics so we will only uh, visit it as much as is necessary for our uh, purpose over here so <clears throat> let's start with the um, uh, yeah before we uh, get into the 2d the, just a summary of what we saw at the end of um, the 1d theory in the last class uh, where we saw that um, uh, many of these things are state of the art are moving towards uh, various complications some many of them are already there and have been there for uh, quite some time now um, the idea is to uh, have a model which is capable of handling all of these complications and um, since we have um, uh, taken advantage of the fact that the cross sectional dimension of um, such a one dimensional structure is very small compared to the uh, overall uh, length of the uh, structure or in a statics problem or the wavelength dominant wavelength in a dynamics problem therefore the problem has broken into two parts one is a cross sectional analysis where we reduce the cross section to a point and the loci of such points forms a 1d curve so uh, there needs to be a 1d reference analysis as well of that curve so there are two parts to this uh, beam analysis one is the um, uh, reduction of that cross section to a point the second is uh, the analysis of that curve itself which is formed by um, many such points at various cross sections um, so we need to account for taper initial curvature pre twist sweep um, arbitrary supports uh, sometimes you might have multi beam systems like you when you have 
uh, let's say multiple sweeps in a wing or when there is a joint etc uh, and uh, statics dynamic stability problems need to be considered so all of this uh, needs to be accommodated in whatever cross section analysis we do and eventually the um, 1D analysis which takes uh, uh, the cross-sectional analysis results as its inputs uh, and then we should be able to extend it to problems involving other uh, fields other than aerodynamics namely the thermal fields, um, control fields in servo uh, etc and um, also um, apart from these complications in the uh, one dimensional uh, structure which could be as complicated as you uh, see over uh, this particular picture over here so you see uh, the reference curve uh, if it's the loci of the centroids of the cross section could be something like this which is um, uh, there, which is fairly complicated but in addition to this uh, in other words it has various uh, different uh, radii of cross section at uh, different locations it has um, a sharp corner at some location and at each cross section um, the cross sectional properties are going to vary uh, as we see but within a given cross section itself there can be further complications as well uh, we already talked about one um, aspect that is the cross sectional shape change as we move along the uh, reference curve but um, there is more to it than that so there can be the um, uh, within the cross section various complications which is what we will uh, see because one part of that is what is the um, uh, 2d uh, shell or panel uh, that we would like to look into a little more detail uh, in today's class so in terms of the typical cross section uh, whether you're talking of an aircraft uh, wing like let's say the airbus um, a350 uh, extra wide body which is um, very close to my heart like the uh, Boeing 787 Dreamliner because of the large amount of uh, composites it utilizes and therefore the uh, huge uh, reduction that it has brought about in costs um, uh, and in pollution as well costs be primarily because of the uh, reduction in the specific fuel consumptions uh, for uh, transporting a, um, a unit uh, a weight of a payload uh, along a unit distance so uh, so these, this is kind of a state of the art. Unfortunately, there's not been too much progress in um, uh, transport aircraft, at least in the last uh, decade or so, a little more than that. Um, so this remains kind of state of the art, at least in that category. Um, so uh, we, if we see any particular cross section of this um, uh, wing, uh, it could ha have a, a large number of materials that are involved. It could have um, various complications in the geometry and our cross-sectional analysis should be able to take care of that not only the cross-sectional analysis um, to give results for the 1d theory but later once the 1d problem is solved come uh, which is basically along the um, span of the wing once that is done uh, we know the uh, one-dimensional uh, displacements in the uh, three directions x y and z and then we um, uh, also know the rotations of the cross-section over and above what is the rotation due to the reference curve itself moving and then um, we have to come back to the cross section and see uh, because of that kind of a behavior of the reference curve what are the stresses generated at each point and what material is there at that particular point and therefore what is the um, uh, potential of that to withstand that uh, would, it fa would it fail or would it uh, be safe enough so these kinds of um, uh, conclusions need to be made so we need to take into account the actual cross section as it exists now the could also be a helicopter uh, rotor blade uh, in which case um, you have uh, an example on the uh, left hand side uh, uh, what you see uh, in this picture over here um, this is a typical cross section of a uh, helicopter rotor blade uh, where you see uh, various uh, materials that are involved um, uh, the um, primary structural load bearing member is a glass epoxy uh, composite that you see over here um, uh, uh, sorry it's a, a carbon epoxy composite it's a graphite epoxy over here uh, in addition you also have 
the e glass epoxy where it is um, stressed a little uh, lesser so that's um, basically what you have and it's kind of a sandwich construction where um, you have the uh, inner core uh, basically consisting of foam um, which would take a lot of the uh, transfer shear and also help in the uh, shaping stability uh, and also you see that um, it, the leading edge is the one which is uh, stressed more and therefore you have the uh, more high performance um, composite namely uh, the graphite epoxy composite with T300 fibers and the 5208 um, epoxy matrix as you see over there. Um, now on the other hand um, I think this came up for our discussion in an earlier class too. Um, why is there um, on the leading edge a cap and um, there are apparently uh, many reasons for it but three main reasons. Um, so for example in this particular case the uh, red portion that you see uh, around the leading edge over here is basically steel um, uh, uh, involving a little bit of alloying uh, with the iron of uh, aluminium and silicon and um, the reason why um, such caps are given uh, one is because uh, you want to maintain the shape fidelity um, while the uh, shape of the entire airfoil is important uh, it's even more important at the leading edge any small change in the shape at the leading edge can um, entirely alter the aerodynamic characteristics of the airfoil. So you want greater shape stability uh, at the uh, leading edge and which is why you use um, uh, something which is more rigid. Um, whereas uh, for more um, uh, material decisions on choice of a material, which material you would want to use in various locations depends on the specific properties as we discussed earlier like specific strength, specific stiffness and specific stability parameters uh, for these small uh, regions which are not going to give you too much of a weight penalty as a whole it's actually the absolute values which are of interest another example of this is the uh, landing gear systems which um, of course are heavy but uh, are not a major chunk of the overall weight of the uh, aircraft and therefore uh, you're willing to look at the absolute values uh, which are going to be um, uh, more critical than the um, relative values at least for these uh, specific applications where you're willing to sacrifice a little bit of weight penalty uh, in order to have something which is um, stronger and stiffer in this case uh, stiffness is the critical thing so coming back to the leading edge of um, a wing or a helicopter rotor blade as in this exact particular example uh, you would typically have um, a steel cap because uh, that's the steel uh, particular chosen for this would have um, a fairly large absolute value of the Young's modulus or stiffness um, uh, and since it's all within the elastic uh, limits that's what really matters so one reason why this um, uh, capping is done is because of to maintain that shape uh, as accurately as possible even in the presence of loads the second reason is that you want the surface to be as smooth as possible so that there is no separation occurring uh, because of any roughness that might occur occur over there. Uh, for example, if you have a composite structure to a uh, large extent it is smooth but it's possible that uh, during handling uh, etc. Uh, there can be certain uh, small um, uh, dents which can be there and uh, those can uh, lead to flow separation. So you want uh, to avoid that flow separation uh, in the uh, leading edge area at least up to um, uh, about 30-40% of the cord around the aerodynamic center as we shall see shortly. So. That is the second reason why it is typically used and a third reason is very interesting and this is typically for um, uh, low altitude um, uh, aircraft typically uh, more of acrobatic aircraft or even sailplanes especially uh, where you see that um, there is going to be a um, uh, possibility of a lot of uh, insects coming and hitting and uh, many of you would be familiar with when you are riding motorbikes in especially in uh, rainy weather um, all these insects coming and hitting your uh, helmet uh, um, pain or even in a, a car you would see that the windshield becomes really dirty with um, many insects which have hit the windshield and um, have uh, died and uh, they have just kind of smudged the entire windshield um, that itself by itself is not an issue but what happens when you try to clean it up when you try to clean it um, uh, because these might have certain uh, sharp components to it they might uh, scratch your windshield same thing happens when you're um, 
having an aircraft which is could be a, could be a sail plane or a helicopter flying at low altitudes um, these could be hit by these insects uh, apart from bird hits which are much more dangerous these insects might not cause any uh, harm to the structure in terms of uh, damage but it can reduce its performance because the leading edge if it's uh, not capped with steel for example uh, it could have uh, these um, uh, things which when cleaned there would be a wear which is happening so uh, wear is basically an abrasion or a friction that is actually happening over there and once that uh, friction is there it can cause certain um, uh, scratches in the surface and therefore the smoothness of the surface is spoiled so that wear resistance uh, while cleaning is also one of the reasons very interesting reasons why uh, you would have such uh, caps there could be many more reasons but these are three primary uh, reasons why you would have that the reason why we are seeing this example is it's kind of um, typical in showing uh, the uh, complexity of the geometry one because of the aerodynamic requirement of it to be an airfoil shape but within also in terms of the structural requirements of you know where the stresses are going to be large and therefore you want to use a, a more um, capable material over there even if it's going to cost you more um, so you're willing to pay that extra buck in order to uh, have that in place and um, uh, in other regions you want to have it um, uh, uh, typically a, a relatively lower cost material like the uh, glass epoxy uh, in this particular case um, even e-glass is sufficient you don't even need to go to uh, s-glass for this uh, particular application and um, regions where just a foam would suffice uh, because it's predominantly uh, to uh, take care of the shear no, none of the normal stresses are going to be large because it's close to the neutral axis and also um, closer to the trading edge um, so uh, so these these kinds of complications if, ne if they need to be handled you need to go to a finite element analysis so what i've shown here um, on the left hand side uh, of this slide uh, is not actually the actual um, uh, wing cross section or a uh, helicopter rotor blade cross section but a finite element model of that so that's what we would eventually go towards uh, so if you see it's broken up into small um, uh, quadrilateral shapes uh, which are all uh, uh, elements very small elements uh, which uh, together make up the entire uh, cross section and then you would do a finite element analysis not of the entire helicopter rotor blade but of just a cross section and that would give you the equivalent cross sectional properties to populate that four by four or six by six matrix that we saw in, a, in the last class so once that is populated then you um, use that to for the 1d analysis of the entire helicopter rotor blade uh, and then the rotor blade dynamics of the entire rotor or if it's an aircraft wing um, of the wing uh, uh, how it's behaving under various uh, load conditions now uh, in terms of how the uh, load data comes uh, it's typically from the aerodynamic analysis and um, again the complication of the aerodynamic analysis could be at various levels um, uh, if it's um, a relatively uh, kind of an inviscid flow for high Reynolds numbers flows uh, you may not need to go for an AVS Stokes kind of an equation whereas um, for low Reynolds number operations uh, low speeds and or um, low um, uh, dimensions let's say the cord is very small etc in such cases you need to uh, take into account the inviscid flow uh, but the predominant load is always going to be the pressure load and um, that is shown in this uh, top figure that you see over here and here you see that um, there's a point which is marked as cp which is basically the center of pressure you i'm sure you would have come across this in your aerodynamics class uh, the um, what this is is basically um, the actual pressure load is what is shown over here uh, in terms of a suction over here uh, that you have that is a basically a low pressure because of the high velocities that are involved uh, over there and here you see uh, basically a relatively higher pressure region over here uh, which is um, uh, be, uh, which is because of the lower velocities that you have on the uh, underside and this is what is basically essentially causing your lift but this is the actual distribution and this is what is um, essentially in understanding the stress but um, what uh, the aerodynamics typically gives you is actually the uh, result resultant of this in terms of um, a force which is perpendicular to the to the airflow 
direction which is your lift and the one which is parallel to the airflow direction which is your drag so using this lift and drag is what we try to um, accomplish um, our overall design as for a beam as a whole because this becomes the uh, distributed force that you're going to have uh, in one of the homeworks you are looking at an elliptical uh, lift distribution for example so how it is distributed along this span um, and uh, if the lift distribution has a certain behavior the drag distribution follows from that uh, from the l by d ratios that we are aware of um, and uh, for the resultant forces, it's not only important of which direction they operate. Uh, one is lift uh, perpendicular to the velocity and uh, velocity of the entire aircraft, that is, and drag, which is parallel to that, but also at which point they act. Because uh, at different points, uh, different moments would be generated. And the center of pressure is defined as that point about which this pitching moment uh, is going to be actually equal to zero. So there's not going to be any pitching moment. So there's a great bit of simplicity because now you you're not going to have any torque which is applied on this um, so-called beam that the helicopter rotor blade or a uh, aircraft wing is so in other words we can consider this entire thing as only two forces which are acting and those two forces are going to cause shear forces and shear stresses which are much smaller than uh, what we are considering namely uh, which is uh, basically the um, bending moment which is going to arise because of these uh, two distributions and in addition of course you are going to have the um, uh, the uh, weights, uh, the self weight of the wing. Um, you're going to have the weight of the um, engine and the thrust of the uh, aircraft engine. All of these are going to uh, cause uh, additional uh, bending moments as well. But more often than not, it's the relief. Um, if it's on aircraft is on the ground, then of course there's no relief. But when its aircraft is flying, the lift is um, uh, in a direction which is uh, almost exactly opposite to the weight, and therefore, uh, unless it's uh, performing certain maneuvers, as we shall see. Uh, uh, shortly uh, but in all those cases um, the weights are acting in opposite direction uh, the uh, thrust is acting opposite to the drag and therefore um, these are kind of um, uh, not adding up uh, they're algebraically adding up but um, uh, eventually they're reducing the bending moment and the uh, bending stresses and uh, the shear stresses as well so uh, so um, if we know the loads which is basically the lift and the drag at the center of pressure it's very advantageous because uh, you don't uh, have to deal with the moment which in this case the pitching moment ha happens to be a torque as far as the um, wing is concerned so you don't need to deal with a torque but the problem is that the center of pressure is going to change with the flight condition if you change the speed of the aircraft if you change the, um, uh, which is typically done by changing the attitude the angle of attack of the uh, aircraft so um, and or the altitudes etc you're going to have the center of pressure going to uh, change um, as well uh, so that's going to become a little difficult from a structural analysis point of view because for each um, load condition you'll have to um, apply these loads at different locations uh, so that's going to be a little dicey so uh, uh, from the structural point of view it's uh, even more advantageous if you know a particular point about which this moment is a constant that is the torque which is coming because of the aerodynamic pitching is going to be a constant and that's um, as as you know um, the aerodynamic center i'm sure you would have come across this as well so now that um, moment is no longer zero as it, it was about the cp that you saw over here uh, but instead uh, it's going to be a constant value of m naught uh, does anybody want to ask a question okay uh, so it's going to be a constant value so this is what we call as the um, so it's not the moment which is constant the moment of course is going to change again beca because of the overall moment is going to change because um, the moment is uh, actually equal to um, uh, the dynamic pressure half rho v squared into the um, reference area uh, typically of the wing um, into um, the chord uh, uh, reference chord length again um, and uh, multiplied by 
by the uh, pitching moment coefficient. So what we are talking would be a constant is actually this uh, pitching moment coefficient, not the moment itself, because the Q being um, equal to half rho V squared um, will change as the altitude changes, density changes, um, and the um, as the flight condition change, the velocity uh, might change, and therefore uh, the moment as a whole will change. The M naught will change, uh, but your C M naught or C M about the AC aerodynamic center will be a constant. So that's basically uh, the advantage over here. Um, in other words, you're going from a, no, a zero torque condition. There's no torque over here on the left hand side when you're applying it about the CP, um, uh, when you're dealing with all the uh, resultant forces about that. Uh, whereas when you're dealing with the aerodynamic center, um, you are having a non-zero torque, but at least you're um, uh, happy that the uh, pitching moment coefficient associated with that uh, is going to be a constant. Uh, you don't need to uh, worry about its uh, variations. Uh, and the aerodynamic center, of course, um, as you know, is uh, fixed um, typically for uh, subsonic aircraft around quarter cord from the leading edge. Um, that is from the leading edge uh, at a distance um, of about uh, C by 4. So that's basically what you see over here. So this particular distance um, that you see is the um, uh, quarter of uh, the overall uh, cord that you have uh, over there. So this is uh, typical for subsonic aircraft, but for supersonic aircraft, it will be closer to half the cord. So the aerodynamic center moves further down uh, to a location like uh, this. Uh, but of course, the type of airfoil um, also is different for um, the um, uh, subsonic and uh, uh, supersonic regimes, typically, which is um, uh, which is uh, optimal uh, for those uh, regimes. Now coming to um, uh, another kind of a design that you see over here, very similar to the uh, one that you saw on the left hand side. Once again, you have a filled core over here. The uh, skin thickness is an important parameter. You have the skin. Um, once again, you have the leading edge cap as you see over there. And now um, this particular green region, what we saw as the graphite epoxy uh, in the previous um, example, is um, actually what is essentially a D spar. Uh, so unlike in, um, in the uh, case of um the um, uh, wing aircraft fixed uh, fixed wing aircraft uh, you see typically i sections as spars here you would typically see a d section uh, as a spar um, covering the entire uh, leading edge and um, um, uh, a part of it of course is the web in addition you could have a, a separate uh, web as well um, which could uh, be made of a different material as you saw over here um, uh, this is um, over here just the uh, graphite epoxy but you could also have have uh, some additional material which is coming because of this e-glass that is uh, further extended over here into a box like uh, structure as well so that you have uh, um, two boxes over there uh, so so uh, the other important features of course are the uh, thicknesses of the various other things the you know, skin thickness uh, could be different uh, closer to the leading edges um, opposed to closer to the trailing edge because we would uh, want to minimize the weight and um, uh, based on the stress levels we would uh, be adjusting that and then of course the uh, thickness of the uh, d spar that you have over here and the width of the d spar uh, that you have and the uh, thickness of the uh, um, additional web that you have over and above uh, what the d spar by itself offers so these um, uh, complications in the cross-section are one because of the uh, cross-sectional uh, shape change that you see over here. Uh, but in addition, as you see in this particular example, uh, there are particular parts which are solid actually, as you see with the foam over here um, and the filled core over here, it could be a aluminum uh, honeycomb as well. Um, or it could be a walled kind of a structure as you see in the uh, D-SPAR region. And um, there again, uh, uh, most cases, of course, you would have thin walled, uh, but um, you could have certain locations where it is uh, thick walled as well. Um, it's, a, it's a question of the design decision. You, how much of uh, mono, closer to monocoque it is, then you would have thicker structures. Um, if it's more towards a semi monocoque, where it's almost a 50% cross section are the stiffening elements and 50% is the skin um, in terms of the cross sectional area, uh, then you would typically have a thin kind of a structure, which is more common. 
and uh, within the thin and thick walled uh, structures again you could have an open kind of a cross section uh, like an eye section or a closed kind of a cross section which is like a box section or a circular section uh, for a shaft etc or it could be a combo like what you have over here uh, if the trailing edge portion is not closed over here you would see that uh, the trailing edge part is actually more like a c section um, or a channel section which is open and then you have a closed section which is more like a box and so you have a combination of a closed uh, section and a uh, open section uh, which makes uh, the analysis a little more complicated so uh, the idea is that you should have an ability to handle all of these uh, for the more realistic case where you need to take into account the entire airfoil cross section you would um, uh, more often than not go for a finite element analysis as is shown uh, on the left hand side but um, there, there are also lots of uh, analytical techniques which have been developed over the years um, which can be used for uh, simpler geometry where you're not considering the entire airfoil uh, geometry but you're only considering uh, let's say a d spar and a, a triangular section for uh, the uh, for whatever is over here you might just consider it as a triangular closed section or if it's an open section um, a channel section with flanges which are kind of bent in many such cases it's possible to have uh, closed form analytical solutions as well it consists of two uh, parts to it the uh, cross section one is of course as a beam uh, cross section but uh, you can deal with it as um, uh, sub components if you deal with the stringers as axial rods which are taking tension uh, on the bottom surface of the wing uh, which is um, basically an, uh, bending because pre predominantly because of the lift all the other loads are um, much lesser relatively so uh, therefore the bottom portion is consisting of stringers which are under tension they can just be dealt with as uh, 1d axial rods the stringers on the top as 1d axial columns and then the spars as um, bending members which are subjected to this distributed um, uh, lift force and then you have these um, uh, the skin uh, along with the um, the web of the spars which are going to act as a box beam uh, and uh, these skins uh, and the web are going to basically take the uh, transverse shear as you see over there so uh, if you look at the, those those things they are basically that is the cover skin as well as the uh, uh, the web of the spars they are predominantly uh, two dimensional members in the sense that um, uh, it's not a cross section dimension which is small compared to the length but it is the thickness which is small compared to two other dimensions uh, of the panel and um, therefore we end up with what is known as a shear panel uh, we call it a shear panel because the dominant load that it takes is the shear um, it does contribute to a little bit of the uh, bending but uh, we typically ignore that and uh, ensure that the design of the spar caps and the stringer uh, takes care of all of the um, uh, bending loads that are there and uh, the transfer shear um, is what uh, uh, because of the shear forces as well as the torque, uh, the torque coming from the pitching moment as we saw in the previous example, but it could come from other sources as well as we shall point out in the um, uh, in the next slide. Um, so now, um, uh, the uh, because this predominantly takes the shear, uh, we we call it a shear panel. But um, essentially, it is taking in plane uh, stresses, and those in plane stresses is what makes it um, uh, 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 to be approximate to be a plane stress problem and uh, most of the initial analysis initial cut analysis is done with that plane stress approximation but as you know the um, the uh, in plane loads are in plane stresses are actually coming because of a, a normal stress which acts on the um, surface of the uh, cover skin but we already saw that for example if it's a hoop stress in the case of the fuselage we know that it's a sigma r by t or sigma r by 2t in the hoop and longitudinal directions respectively and that r by t factor the radius of the fuselage to the thickness of uh, the fuselage skin which could be of the order of 4 mm at the most for even large transport aircraft so uh, whereas we are talking of uh, radii of the order of a few meters uh, many meters in fact so you're talking of um, a factor of 100 or more um, uh, by which this uh, stress that is applied in the form of a pressure load um, which is uh, acting in the form of uh, um, uh, normal stress on these uh, two edges of this uh, panel but right now um, uh, we are not considering the effect of that we will bring that up later 
later. Uh, right now we are looking at it uh, predominantly as a member which takes shear and therefore it's a shear panel um, of dimension A along um, the X direction and B along the Y direction. So the coordinates are marked over here X and Y and then um, we have uh, the thickness to be uniform uh, uh, T that is shown over here and then um, let's say in this case that no normal stresses because let's assume that all the normal stresses have been taken in care of by the uh, stringers and the spark caps so uh, this is um, uh, predominantly taking only the shear stresses and so we have marked that tau and um, uh, taking advantage of the complementary nature we have marked it as tau on both the um, uh, perpendicular surfaces over here perpendicular to the x and the y axis now um, what is the notation for this of course this is acting on the y surface so it's tau y x and this is tau x y um, but they are equal to each other under the case that uh, this is not a magnetic material with dipole moment distribution then in other words in general it's not having any body moment uh, distributions and therefore you take advantage of the symmetry over here so in this case you have basically essentially what you have is a thin sheet material and uh, um, even if it's made out of a metal very interestingly uh, rolled um, uh, sheet metal actually has a certain uh, superior property along the uh, direction in which it is rolled uh, and so therefore um, there is a little bit of anisotropy even if it's a metallic structure um, that one should be aware of but of course it's not the uh, level of anisotropy is not as high as um, uh, in the case of composite materials typically um, but um, uh, you need to be aware of this that the, um, the properties along the thickness direction of the uh, sheet metal rolled sheet metal uh, could be uh, yeah, slightly inferior compared to uh, along the uh, direction of rolling but nonetheless uh, a thin sheet uh, material is what is typically used it could be a composite as well but um, uh, if it's a metal let us say um, you need to take into account the actual properties uh, because of the rolled uh, material that is used and it's used to carry the in-plane uh, shear load as we saw in this uh, diagram of uh, shear stress of tau and therefore the shear panel uh, um, in this case we are assuming it to be of uniform thickness uh, since we are considering only that part of the panel between two stringers and between uh, two ribs um, uh, which are the transfer stiffeners along the uh, span so there is one rib over here another rib over here let's say and um, between those two ribs and between two stringers you're considering a small uh, panel over there and therefore um, within that uh, panel typically you would have a, a reasonably constant thickness mm, but otherwise if you're taking the uh, entire wing surface you would see that there could be a variation in the thickness usually is yes. uh, the highly uh, more highly stressed uh, portions would be uh, uh, having uh, larger uh, thickness compared to the ones which are uh, lesser stressed and typically you would have uh, if it's made out of a composite ply drops otherwise if it's a metal then you would need to take into account um, how to handle that uh, kind of uh, uh, thickness um, by having different sheet metals and typically they would be um, either riveted uh, mostly in the case of uh, metallic structures so the two panels which are riveted one might be slightly higher thickness compared to the other so in other words there's a step like uh, variation whereas with composites you would uh, have a much smoother variation because even though there are ply drops mm, that region uh, where the ply is dropped is like is not of zero um, uh, distance uh, it's a small distance but it's um, finite and over that you would have a matrix uh, rich rich region uh, where the ply is dropped in other words you have um, let's say um, a two ply region over here uh, which suddenly becomes a one ply region this would not happen su suddenly like that there would be a matrix rich region so it's kind of a small taper that you would have and therefore uh, uh, this particular region would not have any fibers uh, but it would have only um, you know, the matrix so it's a resin rich uh, region as you see over there uh, but uh, in this particular example we are considering um, uh, uniform thickness in other words the thickness is not varying along the x and y directions so it's a constant value of t as we showed in the top right corner of this figure uh, now um, the total shear force which results in this uh, because of this shear stress how, what is it reacting with um, is very easy to find out as the uh, shear stress that uh, uh, we are talking about um, multiplied by the, uh, sorry this should be tau 
okay so uh, so this shear stress uh, tau um, which is acting on that thickness has to be multiplied by the uh, cross sectional area uh, which on um, this phase uh, that you see on the right over here there is a phase perpendicular to the y direction uh, where the force is along the x direction so that shear force uh, vx is obviously uh, because of the constant value of tau is just going to be multiplied by the cross sectional area which is the thickness times the width of um, the that uh, panel along the x direction which is a and um, the shear stress uh, again can be replaced uh, using the generalized Ho hooke's law uh, for the shear uh, to be the shear modulus uh, g times the uh, shear strain uh, gamma which is once again uh, the uh, gamma y x uh, to be more precise and um, that multiplied by the thickness times the um, uh, dimension along uh, the x direction so uh, what this essentially means is that for a flat panel the shear force capability that you have that is the vx is going to be proportional to the thickness so for, in other words you have a region where you know that there are going to be larger shear forces from the shear force diagram that you have drawn from the lift distribution then you would uh, try to have it uh, thicker uh, so that it's capable of handling that um, of course the cover skin uh, for the um, uh, aircraft is predominantly taking the uh, shear stresses which are coming because of drag and or the thrust uh, whereas it's uh, basically the spar uh, webs which are taking the um, uh, shear stresses which are coming because of the lift distribution uh, under most uh, flight conditions um, so this uh, shear force capability vx uh, is going to be proportional to the thickness and it's also going to be proportional to the lateral dimension over which we do not have too much control because the uh, span and the uh, cord are decided by the aerodynamicist all that we have is a interplay between them but we have a play over this a and b in spite of that because uh, we have a play over how we space the stringers we can have more number of stringers um, of smaller cross-sectional dimension or we can have um, uh, fewer stringers of larger cross-sectional dimension each so uh, based on that the uh, panel size uh, would change and again the spacing of the ribs is also the prerogative of structural engineers and therefore the dimension the other direction that is b will also change uh, so uh, so these are two geometric parameters that we can play around with as structural engineers in spite of the overall span of the wing uh, or the semi span uh, let's say uh, b by 2 and the chord c uh, that might be fixed but for each individual panel between stringers and ribs uh, we have a control over uh, what value of a and b we have so that um, all of these become uh, design parameters for us a b and t apart from the choice of the material with which you want to make this uh, panel now um, sorry yeah uh, so let's uh, continue with this so that's as far as um, a 2d member uh, over here is concerned uh, uh, as you see over here and um, you would see that um, of course uh, the uh, because of the um, uh, both the uh, direction x and y you would have um, the complementary nature of the shear stress and uh, which means that your um, uh, vx and uh, vy would be uh, dependent on uh, just this a and b as a ratio if you look at uh, vx by vy you would see that it's basically uh, a by b uh, in this particular problem um, but uh, it's not of much significance over here uh, because um, here what you are saying is that the shear stress is the same but the shear force it can take in two different directions is uh, uh, different and that can be adjusted by your uh, spacing of the uh, ribs and the spacing of the stringers typically the rib spacing is much larger compared to the uh, spacing of the stringers and therefore you would have a difference in the uh, overall load carrying capability though tau xy and tau yx are equal to each other vx and vy would not necessarily be equal to each other they would depend on the relative dimensions of a and b that's as far as a flat panel is concerned uh, that's more like a plate kind of a model now we look at uh, shell 
kind of a model where we are um, looking at initial curvature so even in the under the presence of no load uh, that is the aircraft is let's say static um, and we ignore the self weight also still uh, there is a certain curvature which is associated with the airfoil shape and or in the um, span wise direction also uh, let's say typically uh, at the wing tip etc as you see in this uh, particular example of the Air airbus uh, u uh, um, uh, 350 uh, extra wide body you would see that uh, the winglets are there uh, uh, which are having an initial curvature over there so this is not um, uh, a sudden uh, change in the uh, angle but there is um, a small curvature that you see over there so these initial curvatures um, would make it a shell not only in the um, in the cordwise direction which obviously it is because of the uh, airfoil shape but also in the uh, certain regions also in the um, uh, in the span wise direction also very close to the place where it is attached to the uh, fuselage you would see that um, uh, there could be a small curvature that is associated especially with composite it's uh, easy to achieve these things in order to um, uh, make the load transfer much smoother than uh, with um, discrete connections. So coming to a, a shell-like uh, construction, you have an initial curvature as you see uh, in this uh, particular geometry on the right hand side in the picture, right hand side uh, top uh, corner. And um, once again, we are talking of a constant uh, shear stress, a constant thickness. Um, the only complication from the previous example is that now it has a curvature and this is unavoidable from a aerodynamic point of view because you want the airfoil to take a certain certain shape or the winglet to take a certain shape um, uh, so in this case um, we are introducing an xy coordinate system which is very different from uh, what we introduced there so don't compare this um, you know, problem of the shell directly with the plate problem that we saw there there we introduced the xy direction um, uh, uh, along the mid surface uh, here we are not introducing it along the mid surface we are introducing it um, along the aircraft coordinate system and just seeing what is what is actually happening over here so this a and b have no direct correlation with the a and b that we are talking about over there um, uh, so if we want to have a co direct correlation then uh, one of these dimensions should have been uh, perpendicular to the um, uh, plane of this slide um, so it should be with into the slide uh, that is the dimension so we uh, don't confuse between this a b and the a b that we had over here this a b is introduced only to show that this initial curvature means that um, this is not uh, parallel either to the x axis or the y axis it's going to have um, uh, vary along both of them so this curved panel is under constant shear stress again i don't know why the font changed uh, when I went from my Mac to uh, iPad. Uh, so this is uh, shear stress tau. Okay, so now the resulting shear force once again is going to be the um, uh, shear stress multiplied by the cross sectional area over which it acts. And now the um, uh, shear uh, force can be decomposed into two components, uh, one along the x direction, which we call as uh, Vx, and an another along the y direction, which we call Vi, um, you know, both of which are counteracted by this uh, shear stress. So unlike the um, you know, wing spars, which are predominantly taking just the uh, load, which is coming from the uh, lift distribution um, and the pitching moment as well, uh, the torque that it generates and therefore the shear stress what we are talking about in the in the in terms of the uh, wing skin uh, is that there are parts of it which are taking only predominantly the drag and the torque but there are also portions of it in the leading edge for example which are taking the lift and in between they are taking both so because of the curvature that is there in the leading edge over there so in such uh, surfaces you're having a contribution uh, to the shear um, forces uh, in both the direction as far as what that uh, skin can resist uh, so both vx and vy and um, that's going to be um, dictated by uh, the uh, effective length along the x and y direction of this shell and it's not going to depend upon the actual curvature that is there so uh, the resultant is independent therefore of the curvature um, contour shape um, so this vx by vy that you have over here is just going to be um, uh, if you divide this uh, equation one by uh, equation two it's very easy to see that it's just going to be given by a by b and it's going to be in therefore independent of the contour shape 
So in other words, whether I have um, uh, initial shape that is unloaded shape like this or uh, something uh, which is like this, you know, it's just not going to matter. Or even if I have instead of a shell, I just had a panel uh, which is just going straight like this, it's not going to matter. Now these three cases, that is one which is already drawn, one, uh, two which is um, going further out. Uh, in other words, uh, it's, it's having a different radius of curvature and one which is having an infinite um, uh, curvature that you see uh, or infinite radius of curvature or uh, uh, which is having zero curvature that you see over here, if we call it as three, it's very easy to see that you know, the amount of material required to make these shells is going to be different and it's going to be minimum in the case of three, you're going to have the least amount of material required and therefore the least weight penalty and in the case of example two uh, that we drew outer uh, to the actual uh, figure, uh, the amount of material would be much more. So left to the structural engineer uh, himself or herself, they would obviously ch always choose a straight panel. Uh, one, um, it uses less material and from a modeling point of view also, a plate analysis is always much simpler compared to a shell analysis. You don't need to ha handle initial curvatures which complicate the equations a fair bit. Uh, but um, you know that the reason why we are going for a shell is not structural in nature. It's more because of the aerodynamics, uh, because of the what I already described in terms of the airfoil shape and the uh, winglet shape, etc. So, uh, uh, though from a structural point of view, the flat panel is what is most efficient uh, for any given uh, value of A and B, you just want to have this, uh, um, what I drew as uh, example 3 over here, uh, but you can't afford to have that. So, uh, of course, uh, that is for as far as the outer structure is concerned. But now, as far as the spar webs are concerned, uh, that's not uh, exposed to the outer uh, air flow. And therefore, you will always see that the spar web is going to be straight. You don't have a curved uh, spar web. But um, the exception is the D spar that we saw uh, in the helicopter rotor blade, uh, where um, the, um, it is actually going to uh, maintain that leading edge shape apart from the um, uh, leading edge cap of steel that you have, that spar is also going to contribute to that. And therefore, in that uh, exceptional cases where these are extremely thin compared to the helicopter rotor blades are typ typically much thinner compared to the airfoil cross section uh, thickness that is used on uh, uh, typical aircraft like the, um, uh, the A350. Now, uh, therefore, uh, the inner spars uh, for such um, aircraft wings not being exposed to the uh, airflow uh, have no reason to be curved. So if it is curved, it is uh, com uh, complicates in two different ways, as I said. One is it adds more material and more weight penalty. Other is it makes the analysis also much more complicated. It's unnecessary to have something like that. So you would have uh, the spar webs as flat. Uh, so in other words, they are just uh, plate-like structures, uh, not shells. On the other hand, uh, as we saw, wings and fuselage skin have to be, um, cannot be flat. Uh, the, for the wing, the reason is aerodynamic as we saw, why it is not flat. The, for the fuselage, of course, it has to contain um, within the structure all of the payload, uh, typically the passengers and the uh, top portion and the bottom portion, all the cargo. Um, and uh, therefore, it needs to have a finite uh, volume uh, that it encompasses at a, or at a given cross-section, a finite cross-sectional area within that uh, thin walled uh, closed tube, uh, tubular structure that it has, um, almost circular but slightly ovalized, um, as you see uh, if you look at the cross section very carefully. So now, uh, in such situations, you can't have, uh, let's say, uh, there are, of course, if you look at some of the olden um, aircraft closer to the 117 year old um, Wright Brothers aircraft uh, moving slowly from the uh, bicycle mechanics truss like structures to uh, closed structures. Uh, initially, you would see that there are like flat top surfaces fla and um, uh, flat uh, side surfaces and a flat bottom surface, almost like a square or rectangular cross section for the 
uh, fuselage. So in such cases, of course, you're using plate, but again, the aerodynamics of that is uh, very poor. And um, also there could be stress concentrations, etc., occurring at those corners. So we uh, trying to avoid and you have a smoother surface and you typically end up with a, a shell-like uh, configuration uh, that you have uh, for both the um, outer shape of the wing and the outer shape of the fuselage and therefore those cover skins. Look at certain aspects of the uh, loads and in particular the maneuver kind of loads and the load factors which are associated with this. Uh, again this is uh, predominantly a flight and space mechanics uh, problem um, and also uh, an aerodynamics problem so I'll not go into the details of these uh, derivations but for those of you who are interested from a structural point of view how these aerodynamics and uh, flight mechanics play a role in uh, arriving at that you can look at um, uh, one of the reference books for this course namely aircraft structures for engineering students by Mason. Um, it's run through many editions the uh, I think the latest edition is the sixth edition um, about three years old uh, from El Xavier and um, uh, you have uh, ebooks which the library has ordered unlimited accessibility uh, so you can go to the digital e-library of IISC to uh, access this book uh, so the essentially mm, uh, loads can come from various sources we saw that in fact in, uh, in one of the earliest classes itself uh, but what we are focusing on here is the maneuver loads because uh, that's going to what is going to determine what is known as a load factor that we are going to determine it's not just loads but the load factor that um, we are predominantly interested in over here and that load factor that is going to be there um, um, is uh, n which is uh, defined as the lift by the weight and this is a load factor um, which is actually so strictly speaking it should be written as nz because it's uh, in the vertical direction similarly you, you have a load factor which is associated with the uh, other directions the horizontal direction uh, and the sideway direction which is also horizontal as well which are not very critical so we don't typically um, deal with them but um, in a overall detailed design that that needs to be um, accounted for as well so uh, so, uh, uh, even though it should be strictly speaking written as NZ, um, when we just write it as N, it means in the, in the vertical direction and um, the, in the direction which the weight is acting, of course, in a downward way. And um, uh, uh, the lift is what we are uh, measuring as in terms of how many we, um, uh, factors of weight it is basically. Uh, so, in, uh, in, um, in, in the uh, straight and level flight, uh, that you see over here on the top figure over here uh, you know that approximately the uh, lift is equal to the weight and therefore the um, load factor just becomes equal to one and therefore uh, it's just a 1g flight and um, so it's not uh, typically a very critical um, uh, flight phase to consider as far as the structural design is concerned but it's an important thing to analyze um, uh, but certain complications which are uh, usually left out in a um, in a preliminary analysis are things that we need to consider in more detailed analysis so some of these um, um, notations that are there are important already we saw uh, the lift is there and that is acting at the aerodynamic center uh, so that the pitching moment coefficient about that is constant m mm, naught is not constant but cmac is constant and that is going to be multiplied by the dynamic pressure into the reference chord length and the reference uh, cross sectional area ref sorry reference um, planform area of the wing uh, to give you the uh, m naught value now, uh, that uh, aerodynamic set, uh, center is in general going to be different from the uh, center of gravity and uh, both in the um, direction along the length of the fuselage as well as uh, in the height. Uh, though, of course, there is a symmetry about the starboard and port uh, side of the wings. So, therefore, you have a plane of symmetry uh, that is there about which the pitching happens. Um, and that's the reason why the uh, lift, drag and pitching moment are decoupled from uh, the other uh, motions, which is basically the um, what the rudder creates as the yawing moment or the, what the uh, ailerons create as the rolling moment. Um, and, of course, the sideway drift that could be there, uh, usually not because of the aircraft itself, but because of a side wind. Uh, 
uh, that could happen and therefore there's a the relative um, velocity of the airflow may not be in the plane of symmetry it could have a slight uh, change uh, that is a side slip that we call um, over there so um, uh, so in even when there is a plane of symmetry there's no side slip and you're not concerned about the uh, yawing moment and the uh, rolling moment due to the rudder and the aileron respectively uh, even in such a situation you're talking about um, within that uh, plane of symmetry there there have to be a few complications which are to be considered and that is the fact that the um, aerodynamic center uh, could be um, uh, shifted from the cg and it's almost always the case and uh, we need to take into account its um, uh, distance along the x-axis that is along the uh, length of the fuselage as well as along the z direction which is uh, perpendicular to that in the plane of symmetry so now um, so that cg uh, for example in this uh, particular um, example is marked at um, various distances um, from uh, the various uh, parameters that are involved for example b is what um, indicates how far it is uh, uh, above uh, the uh, the aerodynamic center and um, similarly a that you see over here is how far behind the aerodynamic center is the cg and whether it is ahead or uh, behind as you would have uh, seen in flight and space mechanics uh, has certain implications towards stability etc and then uh, you also have the aerodynamic center of the uh, horizontal stabilizer and um, there is a lift which is acting on the uh, because of the angle of attack at the horizontal uh, stabilizer and the airflow around that and um, the total lift is actually uh, the algebraic sum of l and p and uh, p sometimes can be downwards as well especially want to, you want to apply a pitch uh, uh, pitching up moment which usually you do when the aircraft is diving for example and you want to pitch it up so in such a situation you would um, up, uh, pull the control stick suddenly so that uh, you're basically um, tilting these uh, elevators on the horizontal tail uh, in the upward direction and therefore uh, you're causing a downward force and that downward force is uh, going to have a large moment arm because the aerodynamic center of the um, uh, tail at which the uh, tail lift acts is uh, way behind the uh, CG and therefore the aircraft as a, if you're considering it as a rigid body is basically having that uh, pitching uh, because of that even a small change in the uh, lift uh, because of the large moment arm can cause a uh, fairly substantial pitching moment that is uh, there. So uh, though for um, simple purposes we just talk about uh, only lift equal to weight and um, the drag equal to thrust all of these things need to be considered because it's not just the force equilibrium but the moment equilibrium that needs to be considered and the lift generated by other surfaces like the horizontal tail uh, need to be accounted for as well it's not just the wing alone which is uh, producing the lift so this is the moment arm large moment arm or l that i was talking about and then um, of course you have um, the uh, airflow direction v and which is what uh, determines the direction of l and uh, the drag uh, d that you see over here and then there is also the aircraft uh, engine uh, unless it's a glider um, uh, that is offering a thrust uh, that is uh, t over here and that thrust line uh, will depend upon uh, where you are mounting the engine. So, some aircraft can have the uh, engines which are mounted on the fuselage. Um, if it's a multi-engine, uh, uh, then it could be typically on the sides of the, um, uh, the aircraft, which you would see typically for much smaller aircraft, like um, uh, let's say business aircraft, etc., or in fighter aircraft it could be a single engine aircraft which is at the uh, tail of the uh, fuselage uh, so that's where you could have and um, for all uh, civilian aircraft you would have to have the redundancy to have a, a level of safety built in in case there is a single engine failure um, so uh, again um, uh, for the uh, engines which are mounted on the uh, wing it could be either under the wing or over the wing uh, and again the distance at which it is there uh, from the um, uh, fuselage center line uh, could be different so all of these are uh, various design parameters which are decided not only not by the structural engineer but by various aspects uh, that are associated um, one with the aerodynamics one with the propulsion uh, with the stability uh, aspects of the flight mechanics etc 
So um, uh, that is, um, you see that the thrust line is acting at a, a distance C uh, vertically shifted from the CG. And so that uh, C is going to be an important parameter as well, because now you see that that thrust is therefore going to produce a pitching um, in this particular example on the figure, you would see that it's going to pitch, uh, bring a nose down moment. But the way th it is attached for, let's say, uh, the Airbus A350, you see that the uh, thrust line, which is typically uh, along the axis of the uh, nozzle exhaust uh, that you see, uh, that is actually lower compared to where the CG would typically be uh, more towards somewhere within the fuselage um, uh, or the plane of symmetry of the fuselage. So now uh, you would see that this is going to have a pitch up moment in this case. So it all depends upon the particular uh, design uh, features that you are having. Uh, for a large aircraft like this, one of the reasons why you could have the engine mounted here is that uh, for engine maintenance, uh, lubrication, etc., that needs to be done, or some engine repair, it's very easy to access these. You can open up panels here uh, in order to uh, do certain repairs, etc. So, uh, so uh, some of the reasons why it is uh, where it is uh, need not necessarily be um, aerodynamic or propulsion related. It could be from a maintenance perspective also. And whereas for a small aircraft, anyway, the overall height of the aircraft is not very high. So you do not want to have it so low that it is ingesting, uh, let's say, during uh, takeoff and landing or taxiing. It's not ingesting the gravel, etc. Because the, typically these smaller aircraft, uh, business aircraft or acrobatic aircraft may not be operating from, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, well-formed uh, airstrips uh, or airports. It might be um, uh, landing and taking off from um, uh, makeshift kind of uh, runways uh, where there could be uh, the sand etc getting in so you want to have it slightly higher up and that's why you uh, basically put it on the fuselage and still maintenance is not a problem because it's not uh, the, the overall height of the aircraft itself is not as high as uh, let's say this one or uh, even more in the case of Airbus A380 uh, which unfortunately has stopped production so now you see that um, uh, that could be one of the reasons. The other is how far you want to get, uh, put it so that you can have stress relief. Uh, as I said, the engine weight, just like the fuel weight, you want to keep as much as far as towards the uh, tip of the wing as possible and uh, 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 consume what is over here and then only move the uh, fuel uh, towards the inboard. Similarly, the location of the uh, engine will cause different um, moments, bending moments about the uh, wing in the other direction the, uh, and give a relief for what is uh, caused by the drag. So uh, again, um, the location of the engine uh, could come from that particular uh, aspect as well. Another thing that could um, uh, basically decide this factor um, is in terms of um, um, let's say um, yeah uh, so, uh, yeah i do not want to get into that particular complication because um, there could be two ways uh, to doing that uh, so let me uh, li leave that aside uh, for now um, but one thing is could be the exhaust uh, how it is affecting the um, uh, uh, horizontal tail and therefore uh, you would want to make sure that the engine is slightly farther away so that it doesn't affect the horizontal tail. The other could be in terms of the noise that it generates. Um, the acoustic signals are going to be smaller as the engine is farther away. So how, how far you can actually put without uh, affecting the structural aspects, etc. So that could be uh, one of the uh, reasons why uh, you put the uh, engine at particular locations. The other is if there is an engine fire, um, you do not want the engine to be too close to the fuselage because then the uh, fire can spread to the fuselage much more quickly. Uh, the smoke, etc., can uh, infuse much more quickly if there is a damage in the fuselage as well. So you would want to keep it uh, farther away from that perspective as well. So there are many, many different reasons that are uh, going to be um, dictating this uh, C as well as um, how far the engine is uh, from the CG in the X direction as well. 
so I guess I've explained all of these factors. Um, but this uh, case is not so very um, uh, critical for the structural engineer because it just uh, is an n equal to 1 case and uh, that is not a stringent uh, case that we are going to uh, be dealing with. Um, the second one that you see um, at, uh, at the bottom over here is a correctly banked turn. So in other words, just like uh, when you're riding a motorcycle, you know that when you're uh, going around a curve, you're basically banking uh, in order to uh, balance the centripetal forces. So similarly, in the case of the uh, aircraft as well, when it is going, taking a turn, you would see that you would uh, have a certain level of banking that is there. Uh, if you bank appropriately, uh, which is of course done by deflecting the ailerons and therefore it is uh, having a certain rolling moment uh, so there is certain uh, uh, dynamics associated with the um, uh, the other set which was decoupled as well uh, but nonetheless uh, what we are looking at is basically um, a horizontal circle uh, or a circular arc uh, around which this aircraft is going and therefore um, uh, in order to achieve that it has to have a certain banking um, and that creates this um, centripetal acceleration uh, towards the uh, center of that uh, circle circular or circular arc that um, the aircraft is taking so that's the centripetal acceleration which is shown over here so in this case the lift should not only um, uh, balance the uh, component of the weight because the weight is acting vertically down uh, but you would have a, a w cos theta term uh, which is acting along this and then there is the Sorry, then the, there is this component uh, from the centripetal acceleration um, which is going to act in this direction as well so essentially if you do the math you can show that in this case um, the l by w obviously is going to be um, uh, given by that is the n factor that is of critical nature over here is just going to be given by the secant of uh, that angle phi that you have over there so if you are not banking at all then it is very clear that uh, you are going to um, uh, have uh, secant phi uh, which is 1 by cos phi uh, and cos 0 is, zero, uh, is 1 and therefore it is just going to be unity which is very similar to what you have in the um, in the case of the um, level flight but you cannot do that because uh, without banking you can't take that uh, turn uh, so in other words yawing and uh, rolling are coupled with each other and uh, it's only with an appropriate value of phi which can be determined uh, through the equilibria so how we arrive at this is just you are having the uh, three force equilibria summation fx equal to zero uh, summation uh, fz equal to zero and uh, your moment um, the pitching moment which is about the uh, y direction so pitching moment um, uh, because of the aerodynamic pitching moment and all the other forces being away from the cg and therefore a slight momentum that is there for all of them all of them uh, being equal to zero when you solve all of these um, you can uh, show that your uh, n is equal to uh, secant phi so um, th this can um, if the banking is large enough this can result in a very critical situation which could be the case for certain acrobatic aircraft so that's the reason why i'm uh, uh, looking uh, at this and when i say correctly banked uh, all it means is that uh, the value of that fee that banking angle that you should have in order for that uh, circle to be horizontal if you bank it by a, either a smaller or a larger amount you will not be able to complete that circle in a um, horizontal fashion it, it will have a change in altitude as well a small change but it will have a change in altitude as well now uh, coming to um, another example which could be uh, critical is a pull out uh, I actually talked about it a little earlier in a different context. So basically what is happening is that this aircraft is going through a dive. Um, if you let it go through a dive, uh, it will come and crash uh, if it is uh, close enough to the ground. So at some point you would want to recover from that dive. And so you typically what the pilot would do is to just pull on the stick uh, suddenly. And when, uh, when the uh, stick is pulled suddenly, what happens is that um, usually the uh, stick motion forward backward motion will change the angle of attack and therefore the speed as well but if it is done suddenly what happens is that 
the aircraft uh, dynamics doesn't have time to change the speed so the ch the speed will remain the same it's only the angle of attack which will change and that angle of attack will actually increase and so when the angle of attack increases the lift coefficient will increase because the lift coefficient is proportional to angle of attack as you know and that lift coefficient um, is going to uh, basically uh, have a larger l and therefore your l by d l by w that is the load factor is going to be more than one and it typically is going to be the largest when it is at the bottom of that um, pull out so you're uh, diving and then you, this is the recovery state so in between right in between the dive and the recovery is the horizontal state where you have um, changed the attitude and then you're moving up throughout this um, small duration uh, of the pull out we assume that the speed is uh, constant it is approximately and it's only the angle of attack which increases and which causes a large lift and that lift also changes through this path and it reaches its maximum value at this particular uh, location where it changes from the dive to the recovery so that particular location is what is uh, marked over here and um, this is of course in a, a general uh, case and this uh, in this case you would have the centripetal acceleration which is given by uh, v squared by r and uh, that um, divided by your g uh, is going to be the amount by which the load factor is going to increase so once again it's the same set of equations your force equilibria and the moment equilibria in the plane of symmetry of the aircraft uh, this is again because it's a symmetric uh, as you see it's in the plane of symmetry and uh, we are assuming it's a steady state um, kind of a situation so uh, whereas when, when unsteady aspects are brought in uh, the equation could be much more complicated but the uh, load factor in this case is going to be v squared by rg plus one uh, r and g being uh, positive and v squared always being positive this is going to be uh, greater than one as well just like in this particular case your um, uh, secant theta uh, is going to be uh, greater than uh, one over here as well uh, so you are going to see that in all these situations you have a something which is a little more critical than what you have uh, from the level uh, steady steady flight and therefore these could become the uh, criteria for uh, based on which the uh, structure needs to be designed uh, again uh, the um, the thrust line is shown over here at an angle gamma though gamma is always used uh, in more conventional sense for the angle of climb uh, so here it is shown for the thrust line how it is with respect to the horizontal uh, somebody had a question so Vignesh here. Yes, Vignesh. Uh, at the end, the materials engineer will not design uh, whether it's uh, what kind of uh, wing it is or something like this. Aerodynamics is to decide that. That's correct. Then, so, uh, like uh, strip wings or the trapezoidal wings or uh, uh, certain kind of tail uh, ailerons or something like those, mm -hmm. depending on the uh, regime of the aircraft. Correct. Yeah. So one is the material property by the choice of material. The other is the choice of the inner geometry. Uh, so that's where we are coming to now. From all of these aerodynamics and the maneuvers, we know what is the um, limits on n that we would have, and therefore what are the limits on the stresses that we would have, which would dictate, as you said, uh, the choice of the material and therefore the material properties but also the choice of the inner geometry of the semi monocoque construction so within that skin uh, first of all how much thickness of the skin that you want to have again is entirely a structural engineer's prerogative and um, within that skin uh, how many stringers you want to have how many spars you want to have and each stringer and spar how what is the cross sectional dimension it should have what shape it should have all of these are um, design variables that you're playing around with and uh, to make the aircraft as efficient as possible which means that the structural weight to the overall weight of the aircraft should be as low as possible for your choice of materials and your choice of the inner geometry uh, though the outer geometry you don't have control over you have a lot of control over the inner geometry uh, so these are two things that we can play around with with choice of material or materials as is the case mostly we will see in the next class that a single material can't uh, 
satisfy all the requirements so in different locations we'll have different materials in fact we saw that in one of the examples of the helicopter rotor blade also you had e-glass epoxy you had graphite epoxy you had steel caps uh, foam etc so many different materials just within the um, uh, the rotor blade uh, cross section itself again when you move from component to component a lot of changes in materials are going to be there for the for uh, certain specific reasons of how that material performs in different um, uh, kinds of uh, loading situations but uh, always remember that the material choice is not the only thing that we are, we are doing as a structural designer but um, we are also looking at the inner uh, uh, geometry design is that clear from, from, the of, from the perspective of a group of people mm -hmm. who want to uh, build an aircraft or who want to design an aircraft I mean that, that's the ultimate goal why, why we are doing all these things mm -hmm. true uh, so, so it starts with uh, knowing the aerodynamics and, and I mean both the aero elasticity as well, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so, and then knowing the material and science. Correct. Then like uh, how the material fades in a real condition. Mm -hmm. Or, I mean also also on the uh, using optimization techniques to reduce the load uh, or uh, things like those, right? Because uh, I have seen a lot of software which does a lot of if you go to GitHub, mm -hmm. there are a lot of software. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the external yeah. geometry. Okay. So, uh, at the end, all the engineers have to sit together and do it over a loop of loop again and again, right? Until they reach recursive, until they perfection, right? Yeah, that's correct, yeah. So, uh, see, essentially, um, uh, whatever we are studying here as part of flight vehicle structures can be for two purposes, um, uh, very different purposes. One would be uh, analyzing an existing aircraft. The other would be to design a new aircraft, as you said. Uh, so in either case, um, there are certain uh, decisions which are already made and uh, which over which a structural engineer doesn't have control. And there are certain things over which we have play. And uh, optimization does play a very critical role uh, in doing that. But the number of variables are so large that if you look at everything as a whole, it becomes extremely complicated. So we are breaking it up into parts and understanding what is the effect of um, the materials, uh, um, which we will again revisit in one of the classes next week and um, uh, also in terms of the geometry uh, in terms of the um, uh, various uh, semi monocoque constructions uh, that are possible so optimization uh, would lead to uh, the choice of design variables in terms of the various materials where they are located and uh, each of them what uh, component they make and th those components what cross sectional geometries they are going to have um, all of this is going to be decided apart from the uh, thickness of the uh, cover skin as well at various locations the spar uh, um, web skin uh, spar web etc so all of these uh, decisions need to be made uh, based on that uh, but to get to that level these maneuvers are important so you need to know uh, the particular aircraft that you're designing uh, it could be a passenger aircraft it could be an acrobatic aircraft it could be a fighter aircraft it could be a helicopter based on that again within each one of them what is the mission profile that we are designing it for and based on that mission profile which are the critical parts of that mission and that critical um, portion of the mission could be landing for some component could be takeoff for some other component or it could be let us say uh, it could be um, a particular maneuver for some other component uh, so uh, you need to really understand um, uh, each one of those phases and see which components are stressed the most under which uh, particular uh, maneuver or uh, phase of flight and then we had to have to uh, account for um, those uh, differences and uh, each component has to be designed for that particular phase of the flight or that particular maneuver for which it is stressed the most and that may not be the same for all the components so that's the reason why we need to look at uh, these samples so whatever i'm presenting over here three or four examples of maneuvers is not comprehensive because this is not the subject matter of this course but i also wanted to give you a taste of where this thing is coming from because that value of n what is the maximum value of n it can suffer and what is the minimum value of n it can suffer are going to play a very 
critical role in making our structural decisions and the optimization as well. So it's important that we uh, account for all of these aspects and which is where um, uh, the purpose for this particular slide comes. Okay, Vignesh, um, this leads us to a very, very important part of um, uh, flight vehicle uh, analysis or design, uh, what is known as the um, load factor and in turn, um, which we saw of course in the previous slide and how it is related to the speeds of the aircraft, that is um, what we call as the uh, VN diagram. Okay, so uh, we are now uh, talking of what is known as a VN diagram also called as a flight envelope many of you who are working on materials might have understood uh, failure envelopes which are drawn for particular materials you know um, uh, if it is uh, undergoing a single kind of a stress let's say uniaxial tensile uh, test you know that um, the material might yield and then probably eventually uh, have a, a failure uh, which we call as the ultimate tensile strength etc but more often than not the material is um, uh, uh, stressed from multiple directions and therefore uh, uh, when you plot let's say sigma x versus sigma y and you have both these stresses in place you have to uh, get a failure envelope you are within that failure envelope you know that the material is safe and outside it's not going to be safe uh, and on the uh, curve itself it's going to be a boundary uh, kind of a situation where it's moving from a safe region to a unsafe region very similar to that we have now um, what is known as the vn diagram over here which is a flight envelope for the aircraft as a whole the aircraft is supposed to operate within certain speed ranges and similarly it's also supposed to operate within certain ranges for the load factor n itself we saw examples of n uh, in the previous slide one case the for the state um, for the level flight um, steady level flight it was n equal to one for the um, uh, case where it was banking uh, appropriately it was a secant of phi in the other case it was v squared r by um, uh, g plus one uh, so in all of these cases basically what you're seeing is that there is a possibility for n to vary if at all it varies just like the speed can vary the speed of the aircraft can vary similarly the lift as a factor of the weight can also vary but if it varies how by how much can it be allowed to vary uh, so that it is structurally safe and it is uh, safe to fly as well so from these points of view um, we have something similar to what we have for a material as a failure envelope we have for the aircraft as a whole what is known as a flight envelope so as long as it is within that um, uh, range of speeds and within the range of uh, load factors it will be safe if it goes beyond that there is a possibility of damage so that's basically what um, the vn diagram or uh, sometimes called as a vg diagram as well because n is actually telling you how many g's at which the aircraft is flying so one g flight being a steady state um, uh, level flight and um, a larger g would be typically what uh, you would experience for example uh, i'm sure many of you have gone on roller coasters so as you are going on a roller coaster uh, you would see that um, when you are accelerating upwards uh, basically what's happening is a, a, a downward flow of the blood and so your um, brain is getting lesser amount of uh, blood supply than usual and therefore you feel kind of slightly dizzy uh, if you're not able to take that kind of a level in a fighter aircraft it could be even more uh, and in a space shuttle for example it could be even larger so uh, astronauts and fighter aircraft pilot are typically trained to um, uh, uh, handle uh, g values uh, more than typical average uh, human beings so um, keeping that aside apart from the human being able to handle certain g levels the aircraft itself as a structure uh, can handle only certain range of g's so uh, and this uh, level of G's, if it is crossed, 
can ca cause either the aircraft to have um, some permanent uh, deformations uh, which goes into the plastic uh, range or it can uh, cause the entire failure that is for example a wing breaking off because the lift becomes so large compared to the weight of the aircraft that um, uh, the wing is not able to handle anymore and the connection between the wing and the fuselage or some other location might actually fail and um, the, uh, part of the wing could break off and fall which could be disastrous for the uh, flight and whoever is on it. So now uh, we are talking about um, uh, how to generate that particular uh, VN envelope uh, that is the region within which you could be safe and uh, this is basically coming from the very definition of N. We know that N is um, as we defined in the previous slide L divided by W and the lift is going to be given by your dynamic pressure which is half rho uh, V squared into the uh, reference area which is typically the wing uh, platform area um, and um, this is going to be multiplied by your CL and um, if you want to um, look at what is the maximum value that you are pushing this N2 uh, at low speeds it is going to be dictated by what is the maximum value of uh, CL that you are going to have uh, because you know that if, if you plot um, let's say uh, CL uh, versus um, alpha um, uh, for a symmetric airfoil it will pass through the origin and then it will reach a maximum and um, it will reach uh, it will have separation of flow and therefore the uh, you can no longer increase the lift by increasing the angle of attack which of course is the angle between the velocity vector and the zero lift line of the aircraft so now uh, that value of cl um, at which the aircraft stalls or in other words suddenly loses uh, lift and therefore uh, starts falling down um, is basically your uh, CL max as you know and similarly you would have a CL max in the um, negative regime as well which in general could be um, of a different value compared to the one in the positive direction even in absolute terms. So now what we are talking about is that um, uh, the velocity and n are related through this particular relationship of course this is divided by w and uh, in fact we can take this s uh, to the bottom and um, talk about it as a wing loading uh, rather than as the absolute weight that we are talking about that is a wing load uh, per um, unit area of the wing um, surface so now and this half rho v squared is nothing but the uh, dynamic pressure but now we are seeing that the relationship between n and v is a quadratic relationship and if we plot that n versus v is we get this particular part of the curve on the left uh, top corner so you are having this oa is basically generated because so the curve oa is generated from this particular uh, relationship similarly instead of this cl max um, being this one we if we instead put this value over here that is the negative cl max which could be for example when the aircraft is um, uh, flying inverted which is a very very rare situation it could be sometimes for maneuvering aircraft highly maneuverable aircraft like acrobatic aircraft or even fighter aircraft which could be um, as we were saying uh, pull out from the dive and actually uh, uh, form a loop like this so in some part of that vertical loop that it is doing it's actually flying in an inverted way and therefore uh, it is uh, the negative cl max and the negative n max uh, becomes important as well so that particular region if we just put there then you're going to have a different kind of a curve which is not necessarily symmetric because your cl max value is not symmetric and you're going to end up with um, the curve uh, of which is associated with this so now um, this uh, if drawn actually can just go on extending that quadratic curve but that is obviously going to cause the maneuvering load factor which is on the vertical axis which is n uh, to be very large and that large value 
can either be not taken by the pilot because um, or the passengers even more um, because it's going to be too much of a blood outflow from the brain if it's positive and blood flow rushing into the brain uh, if it is a, uh, basically a negative uh, load factor that you're going to have for example in a kind of a free fall or uh, accelerated uh, downward motion that you're going to have so in such situations you see that you there's no point in extending this quadratic curve beyond a certain value of the uh, load factor there has to be a cap on how much in that we can sustain uh, one as human beings the other as a structure because the larger the load factor the larger the lift and therefore the wing is beyond a particular point is going to uh, have a failure uh, because what is that lift after all it's basically the distributed load on this in uh, the direction perpendicular to the velocity and therefore that is going to cause bending so more that um, uh, n value more the lift value and therefore more the bending and eventually the bending stress is going to be so large and the bending curvature is going to be so large that eventually this can have permanent deformation and if it is stretched even beyond that it can have a permanent failure uh, by breakage of the wing at some location which is more stressed so this is basically what we come up with this uh, curve ac that you see over here and on the negative side similarly your fe so your n max um, which could be dictated by either the pilot or uh, the passengers or it could be dictated by let us say the um, the structure or sometimes it could even be dictated by the avionics so for example um, in fact more than half the cost of an aircraft is said to be avionics these days uh, and the avionics are all on pcbs uh, printed circuit boards and some of these pcbs and the ic's that are used um, may no longer work at a certain level of accelerations because they are loaded so much that they structurally fail. The PCBs could break, uh, the ICs could uh, no longer sustain that kind of load, etc. And so the avionics could sometimes be the uh, weak link in the chain. It's rare, but it can happen. Uh, you're stretching the limit of the load factor. Um, the failure could not necessarily be of a human being or a structure, but it could be of the avionics as well. So based on all of that, this n max results in these two uh, curves what we see as ac uh, and uh, fe so these two curves ac and fe are basically coming from that uh, loading limit now there is another aspect which is going to come is that you have a certain uh, maximum speed that you can uh, have beyond that speed uh, it's a name called as a never exceed speed what happens is that your dynamic pressure q that you are having over here that is your half rho v squared um, because it varies as v squared is going to be very large and large dynamic pressure also means a very large load so a very large load need not necessarily come only from a large load factor it can come from a large dynamic pressure as well and that's where your d1 d2 this line uh, which is known as the design diving speed uh, value being VD on the horizontal curve, which is um, the flight speed. And in many cases, you want to have this uh, immune to the, um, uh, the altitude at which the aircraft is flying. Instead of the actual flight speed, you might uh, instead deal with the equivalent air speed. Um, which is basically equating the um, the uh, dynamic pressures and so therefore uh, it would be factored in with a square root of uh, the ratio of the air densities at sea level uh, to the altitude at which you're actually flying so that uh, you can use the same uh, figure uh, same flight envelope at various altitudes but that's not usually a very good um, uh, practice because even cl max can actually change with altitude and a few other uh, quantities can and, um, change with altitude so it's um, uh, like for example the uh, Mach number at which you're flying and therefore the um, the way the CL uh, alpha curve behaves because of that um, could change when you're especially transitioning from let's say uh, subsonic to supersonic in a supersonic aircraft the transonic regimes etc so it's not always a good practice but for low subsonic aircraft um, and to some extent even for transport aircraft you uh, typically deal with 
instead of the flight speed, the uh, equivalent air speed, which is uh, square root of rho by rho SL multiplied by the actual speed that you can use for um, dealing with the um, uh, the flight envelope instead of having to redraw it at different altitudes you can use one for the sea level altitude and that itself uh, as long as you know that the horizontal axis is of equivalent air speed uh, it works fine uh, so this design diving speed is the limitation coming from so in other words that d1 d2 um, line that you see is basically uh, coming from the uh, q max that you can have in other words your half rho v squared uh, max so this being a max uh, because beyond a certain um, value uh, the loads are uh, because of the high dynamic pressure are so large that the aircraft cannot sustain it once again it results in um, the wing uh, breaking off eventually so um, uh, so one um, aspect of, so both of these whether it is ace and fe on the one hand or d1 and d2 d1 d2 on the other hand both are coming from purely structural reasons mm, uh, but the uh, cause of the failure is going to be different one case because the load factor became so large and therefore the lift is so large the other is because of the dynamic pressure became so large and therefore the lift is so large essentially the lift is becoming very large and um, the uh, bending moment is going to become very large the bending normal stress is going to be become very large it's going to cross the material failure limits and it's going to break but before that happens uh, uh, prior to that it there is going to be a large deflection and some of this deflection could be permanent getting into the um, uh, the plastic uh, regime if that materials that you're using are plastic but if it is not plastic if it's like a brittle material like a let's say an epoxy based composite then uh, you're going to have a direct failure that is going to occur so it's very very important that we don't enter into those regimes so in other words anything outside this curve is going to be a dangerous situation now um, there is some bit of a relaxation uh, if if whatever we talked about was the uh, flight envelope it should have actually been uh, having 90 degrees over here but there is some level of relaxation that is given so you have this line cd1 and ed2 uh, which is coming from the design cruising speed vc we say up to vc we have to design the aircraft for such a large value of uh, the load factor that is over here uh, which is your n limit uh, that is there but you don't need to design for n limit for if you are flying the aircraft beyond the design cruising speed because then it's your problem you are you are flying it beyond the um, uh, cruise speed for which it was designed obviously um, you are uh, also in uh, to ensure that you have um, a load factor which is even lesser than the end limit so that's the reason why you have that um, uh, 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 non horizontal line which is connecting this point c and d1 and similarly on the negative side between c e and uh, D2. Uh, so this now becomes the region within which you are supposed to fly the aircraft in order to uh, keep it safe. Now uh, what happens if you go beyond that in this range it becomes positive stall. In other words as long as you are below this value of speed called VA which is the speed at this point A which is called as the maneuvering point because if you are below that speed VA, in other words, you are flying the aircraft at a velocity V which is less than VA, then you can have safe maneuvers. You can do any kind of maneuver and you will not get into uh, the uh, problems with N because even before that, the aircraft is going to stall. So in other words, uh, you have the aircraft which is flying, uh, suddenly um, you are uh, basically reducing the uh, speed or um, you are uh, having uh, at a particular speed, you are increasing the angle of attack so that you are having uh, the CL max which is reached and eventually there is a um, uh, stalling which happens and because of which the aircraft is suddenly going to lose its lift. 
so as long as this is happening at an altitude which is fairly um, above the ground level you uh, have an ability to overcome that stall and you can recover from that stall so the stall recovery is possible without having caused any permanent da um, uh, damage or even permanent deformation to the wings so that region from zero to va or actually not zero but uh, the um, the speed at which the at uh, n equal to 1 so this is n equal to 1 which corresponds to the cruise uh, value and at that whatever is the uh, speed um, that particular speed is the stall speed uh, in cruise steady level flight and as long as you are between that value and va which is the maneuver speed you can perform maneuvers uh, at the most your worst case scenario you will get into a stall but you can recover from that stall as long as you are maintaining a certain altitude so there's no problem but once you cross va that is speeds higher than va you are going to uh, have issues because you will not enter into a stall uh, you will enter into a value of n which is larger than uh, this n limit that you had in other words you're going to cross this um, uh, ac line and therefore you're going to have uh, the possibility of either permanently deforming or damaging your wing same thing could happen in an inverted flight when you're crossing this line uh, fe so um, these are important things to remember that is the you know, one is what is known as the design diving speed vd which is like a never exceed speed you should not supposed to cross that otherwise because of large dynamic pressure there will be a structural failure if you are uh, crossing this n limit either positive or negative then you are going to have uh, structural damage or um, uh, large deformations which are again uh, going to lead to eventually to failure so uh, so this is basically what's going to happen in this particular regime um, but uh, the um, way the design is done is uh, fairly conservative and uh, therefore uh, these these are expected values but the design values are typically much larger than that and that's where the factor of safety comes into picture and uh, you would see that you here we have um, what is known as the ultimate load factor which is one and a half times the limit load which is uh, n1 so if you take this value as n1 that is the limit load so you are uh, designing the actual aircraft that is the materials and the geometry so that it can take an ultimate load factor of 1.5 n1 but still you uh, tell the pilot and whoever is flying the aircraft that ac is your limit so you don't cross that so this is only to give you a buffer to uh, help you there and um, there's also something in between which comes which is the proof load uh, so that mm, so so this uh, proof load that you see over here which is basically to avoid the maximum uh, deformations so that's typically somewhere in between which is about a quarter more than the limit load so it's 1.25 times n1 so in other words effectively what you're saying is one is a strength based design the other is a stiffness based design which is usually a little more critical because you do not want permanent deformations to set in now how did this factor one and a half come up um, this is almost a 90 year old uh, factor that is used uh, unfortunately in many cases uh, still but uh, many of the um, uh, uh, large and um, uh, large aircraft uh, manufacturers are moving towards uh, more um, uh, knowledge based uh, factors of safety uh, depending upon the class of aircraft that they are designing and all the data that they have collected and the certifying agencies have been convinced about certain um, components which can ha have a factor of safety which is less than 1.5 but this 1.5 actually comes from uh, the ratio of the ultimate uh, tensile strength to the yield strength of uh, a particular aluminium alloy which was commonly used uh, yes vignesh sir it's 130 oh i'm sorry uh, okay okay so yeah go for lunch as well as okay fine uh, so so i think we will uh, stop with this because this is a good place to stop we have uh, covered um, various aspects of the uh, flight envelope um, we will take forward from here in terms of what is the takeaway from this flight envelope for the loads acting on the aircraft as a whole because as of now we are considering the aircraft as a point or at the most as a rigid body 
Now, um, uh, that's not the case. It's actually an elastic, uh, flexible body and made out of many components. So how each one of those components uh, experiences this uh, N factor um, at various speeds and how we are supposed to design them for the, uh, that and how the load gets transferred from one component to another is what we will uh, look at in uh, the next class. So thank you very much. If those who are willing to stay, uh, stay back, uh, uh, want to have uh, any doubts or questions answered or cleared, I, I would be happy to do that. So, so the rest of the class may leave. Second, can you stop the recording? Uh, no, uh, let's uh, have the question and answer doubts uh, recorded as well. Um, so we can uh, stop it after that. Okay. In the case, then I have a question. Some yeah. people are sending the assignment. Uh, if some a person is sending the assignment just today, wants to send, and he, uh, he or she wants to uh, access it today. So what mm -hmm. should the teacher assistant do? In of late submission of assignments. Yeah, there will be a penalty for late submissions because um, it's told right in the beginning of this course that uh, one week is the time from the date on which the co uh, the assignment uh, is pro uh, is given uh, for submission. So any um, additional day will uh, involve uh, uh, some penalty that uh, you teaching assistants will have to decide upon. Okay. So more the delay, more the penalty. Okay, sir. Thank yeah. you, sir. I, I got to go, go to the mess. Okay, go ahead, Vignesh. Uh, so, if there are any questions from the students on the technical aspects, I would be happy to answer. Otherwise, we'll meet uh, next Tuesday. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank okay. you, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. मृत्युंजय मंत्रा त्र्यंबक यजा सुगंधि पुष्टिवर्धन उर्वाकमिव बंधना मृत्योर्मुक्षेयमृता सहस्रमयुत पाशा मृत्यो मर्तवे तान्य मयया सर्वा नवयजाहे मृत्यवे स्वाहा मृत्यवे स्वाहा